Hi, everyone, and welcome once again to another one of my podcast and YouTube videos and Gaudi Metzpez 22.com. Uh, I am very happy and thrilled to have an old friend actually on the show today as my guest, Father Alan Hoffa. And, you know, Alan, I probably knew you when you were still Alan before you were even ordained, right? I think Definitely. I did. Yeah, I, did. Yeah, I, I guess I knew I knew Carrie, your wife first, because she was at the seminary. And yeah. then we got to know one another and, you know, all different kind of connections up in the Lehigh Valley with you being down at the sales, et cetera. So, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, it's good to see you again. And uh, Father Hoffa has worn many, many, many hats in the Diocese of Allentown. He is, in my opinion, a hero because he is one of those diocesan priests who uh, has not only weathered the storm and, uh, you know, not only put up with all the things you got to put up with as a pastor, but he actually loves being a priest and loves being a pastor. And, uh, and, and it shows the joy of his priesthood shows. And I am always deeply appreciative uh, of diocesan priests that, that, that events that kind of joy in their priesthood. Uh, anyway, if Father Hoffa is currently the pastor of Holy Guardian Angels Parish in Reading, Pennsylvania, correct? Correct. Now, is that the only hat you're wearing right now, or is there another hat or two um, or three? I have a a bunch of fun hats. I'm one of the Episcopal Masters of Ceremonies for the bishop, so go around and MC um, and uh, serve on some different committees uh, and things like that. Uh, and, you know, just what, whatever, however I can be of assistance, I serve on the board of our local Catholic high school, Burks Catholic. And uh, I, the, the thing um, that uh, I, I really love is, I think, the reason why we're here today, which is I am the chair of the Diocese of Allentown Lumen Christi Commission. And that is our diocesan response to the evil of pornography. And right. That is yes. Really awesome. That is why we're here. We're going to discuss a, a topic that I used to teach about all the time in my classes back in the day at DeSales, uh, pornography uh, and the and the evils of pornography, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the problem has only gotten much worse since I retired from teaching 10 years ago. But but before we get into that, a quick update to all of my uh, viewers, listeners and so on who know about the injury I suffered on my farm last week. Uh, for those who don't know, I ripped apart a bunch of muscles in my lower abdomen, upper right leg area, uh, lifting a piece of heavy equipment. And it is excruciatingly painful. Uh, but the good news is I don't require surgery. Uh, it will take about a month of rest from physical effort uh, to, to heal, uh, but it will heal. Uh, but right now, if, if and occasionally during this interview, I, I let out a shriek or a scream, it simply means I shifted in my chair improperly <laughs> and tweaked something that I shouldn't tweak. Uh, so but I can't just lay in bed all day long. And I had this scheduled podcast that I've been very much looking forward to. Father Hoff, I had to cancel it once before. So I'm very much looking forward to this. So let's get right into it. And I know that it's actually probably a topic, especially uh, for people out there that have had issues with pornography, and that's a lot of people, or right now for parents who, you know, especially if young, you know, children reaching the age of eight, nine, 10, and then certainly on into adolescence and so forth, the burning question of, you know, what do I do to shield my children from this? But anyway, let me, let's uh, turn it right over to Father Hoffa. And first, I would like to ask you, what got you involved in this kind of ministry uh, to people having problems with pornography in the first place? What prompted you to do this? So the first seven years of my priesthood, um, I was the, the bulk of that. I was the chaplain at Allentown Central Catholic High School. And then also during that time for two years, I was the director of our office, office for Youth and Young Adult Ministry at the Diocese of Allentown. And I was also uh, for three years, the chaplain at Catholic chaplain at Lehigh University. And so a lot of engagement with young people. Um, and young adults. And so, again, you know, working especially with administration and, you know, connecting with the kids through campus ministry, you were getting these unfortunate stories of uh, sexting. Um, and then, you know, those who were just heavily involved with pornography and all of the ramifications of that, you know, parents finding out the betrayal trauma associated with that. Uh, also, relationship breakups over pornography and then kids who just you know, couldn't find themselves getting into relationships because of pornography. And it was at, right at the time where I was transitioning to leave uh, high school ministry in 2016. And we'd had some folks come in from Stewardship, a mission of faith uh, out located out in Elizabethtown, 
uh, PA, and they were doing some evangelization where they would come in first Fridays with our kids and lead them through uh, guided meditation in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And Rob Longo uh, was a guy. He now, uh, he and another guy, uh, Luke, they have a, a, a ministry called Live Vertical. But uh, at that time, Rob was with Stewardship and Mission of Faith, and he said, we're starting a ministry under our stewardship umbrella that's called Integrity Restored. And I and I said, what's that? And he says, well, you know, this issue of pornography is, is pretty big, and uh, it's massive, and we need to start, you know, bringing to the forefront not only what we believe from a moral theology and a spiritual uh, uh, focus, but also combining that with the truth of science and the psychological and the neuroscience associated with it. And um, who they had connected with was my colleague, Dr. Peter Kloponis, uh, from down in the main line in the Philadelphia area, uh, whose practice is booming um, right now and uh, has added on a number of therapists in his, uh, in his practice uh, because of this issue. So the Integrity Restored um, thing came there. And I had just gotten done working with the situation at the school uh, of many, but this was one where, again, you know, the the young people, they, they'll send pictures or videos um, to other people. And this one made its way onto uh, a, a, an anonymous um, internet platform. And so it really hit me to the heart of, like you said earlier, and your kind uh, compliments of me, like really caring about my people. And, you know, those kids were my kids and I would give my life, life for them. And when I, I saw just the hurt in one of my kids because this had been done, um, I, I said to myself, this something needs to change. And this it happened, you know, very fortuitously. And by God's grace that Rob came to me about integrity restored and said, this is what we're doing. And I've been all in. Um, so, again, that was in the spring of 16. We we're here 17 years or I mean, se seven years later. And just the expansion, what we've learned, and uh, all of that has been amazing. And but there's still much more that we need to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and uh, not to deflect from from your uh, reasons for getting into. I remember that I got interested in, in lecturing on it in my classes. Uh, it wasn't even on my radar uh, as as a non viewer of pornography. I was really, you know, not even that clued into how pervasive it was. Uh, but I remember that I had a particular male student who went from being a, a halfway decent student in my the first class I had with him and the second class I had with him. He was just getting all F's and he wasn't turning anything in and he seemed depressed and despondent all the time. So he came into my office one day after I asked him to. And I said, I, I won't mention his name. I said, what, what, what gives? What's going on? Uh, is there something wrong? And he fr then freely admitted to me that he spends almost all of his he spent all of, all of his free time surfing the Internet for pornography. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. Here was a young man with all kinds of promise before him, all kinds of, of just a wonderful future, an intelligent, you know, mature young guy who succumbed to this to this addiction. Uh, and, it, and it essentially ruined his life. Uh, and and uh, he eventually, thank God, sought help and uh, and returned to a kind of sanity. And and then I started doing a little digging and, and you know, and asking questions to my more forthright students, you know, privately. And oh, yeah, the flood just started coming out about and I was assuming, too, at first, well, this is probably mostly just guys, it's guys, it's guys. But increasingly, it was the girls. Yep. And, and I thought, OK, I, I have to talk about this. This is the great hidden thing. So that that brings me to a, 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 I, so many questions that I want to ask you, but let's yeah. uh, let's start. Let's build off of that. Uh, that insight. Uh, eventually, I want to ask you about what it is that pornography actually does to us, you know, mm -hmm. psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. But right now, to me, uh, the, one of the things that interests me is that it's not a topic that is spoken about publicly enough. It's a great health crisis in our society, in my point of view, and yet you don't find any of our public leaders, any of our major educators or anybody wanting to talk about this. It's this sort of great hidden vice permeating our culture, rotting it out from within, and yet nobody wants to talk about it. Why do you think that is, Father? That, I, I'm going to go up in 20 different directions here, Larry. You um, go right ahead. You go right ahead. You hit so many different things. Um, one of the first things that I need to say is that, uh, you know, our bishop here in the Diocese of Valentine, Bishop Schlert, and yeah. I can't tell you just on that fact. There's many reasons why I'm proud to be a priest of the Diocese of Allentown, 
But one of them is from day one when uh, then Monsignor Schlert met with the folks over at uh, Stewardship Mission of Faith and I. Um, he's been behind this 100%, so much so that we have a diocesan commission that is working and, and addressing this issue. And he has been courageous. And I think that's the one thing um, that is is needed is the ability for people to be courageous, especially yeah. when w in not using the excuses of sins of the past. And what I mean by that is that we live in so many situations. Sorry about that. Oh, that's um, all right. We live in so many situations yeah. where um, we live in so many situations where because of things that have happened in the past with clergy, sexual abuse and stuff like that, you know, it, it's held, you know, priests back from going into schools, being around young people, et cetera. And one of the big things that's also come from this is, you know, we don't talk about anything regarding human sexuality and stuff like that. And in all honesty, this is part of the devil's plan of attack. The devil's going to, you know, is using, he uses sin, but then he also uses the, you know, how a sin affects society to be able to keep things, you know, hidden and things quiet. And so the church does need to be at the forefront of talking about this because we know the difference between right and wrong in this regard. And we know what this does to people's mind, body, and soul. And so we need to, we need to talk about that. And, you know, while there are other, you know, we've made many overtures to reach out to, you know, dioceses and we have opportunities to train priests um, and to be able to do trainings for, you know, uh, you know, diocesan systems in terms of education and stuff like that. There's a lot of places they say thanks, but no thanks or thanks. But, you know, we're dealing with so many other problems that we can't address this one. And the sad part is, is that people aren't making the connections. And, you know, you get people out there, for instance, who are really concerned with, for instance, human trafficking. Well, guess what? One of the biggest industries that's, supp that, that's supplying the need for human trafficking the pornography. pornography that's right but you you know you go and say that and the people who stand up and say we need to end human trafficking and you say okay let's put a stop to the pornography business and they're like whoa no 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 um so th that is that that's a big problem i think the other thing um when you get into talking about you know why people don't want to talk about this is it, it has to do and this goes all the way back to paul the sixth with humana vitae um, that people, you know, when it comes to the, you know, the, the over-sexualization of, of our culture, um, you know, we, you should be allowed to do whatever you want. It's the moral relativism that is rampant in the world in which we live. And it's not, it's not healthy. It's not good um, because the, the, everybody continues to make up their own truth and their own permissions about these things until people get hurt or they feel the harm and the effect of these things. And so- yeah. You know, the, the world in which we live says, oh, it's it's perfectly fine to do this. It ha it has no harm. It has grave amounts of harm. And that's why at Integrity Restored, um, when we talk about our approach, it's, again, not only from a, a Catholic moral teaching side, uh, from the spirituality side, but it's also from that neuroscience and psychological side of its complete messing with the brain, um, its highly addictive nature. Uh, we get into, you know, the the fact that it's anonymous, affordable, you know, that we call the five A's, um, you know, the addictive aspects. Um, th these are the things that are are causing it to be so prevalent and so, you know, so much of an attack on the world in which we live. But while we're working on this, there's actually hope because, Larry, um, in s some states and also in the United States legislature, in the Congress, there is effort on behalf of lawmakers to label pornography as a public health crisis. Yes. It is a slow, it is a slow moving momentum, but it, there is some momentum nonetheless, because we're finding more and more for the people who are making the connections that, you know, all of this is, is, is connected. You know, when we go and, and talk about, for instance, um, divorce rates and stuff like that, there's a big, big reason why, um, you know, between that and the lack of marriages and, you know, we can get into this, but it's because yeah. of pornography. But I think it's the thing of we need to make the, the connections and we need to be courageous about talking about the problem. Because the truth of the matter is, is that every single person in this world, every single person in this world is either directly or indirectly affected by pornography. And you could say, well, that's for anything. No, this is a little bit more intensive because the the, the rampant nature and the accessibility to pornography 
it's direct effect on the person from a uh, from their their human sexuality to their to to their their overall brain chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It is so destructive and we need to bring light to it so that, you know, and it doesn't discriminate either. You know, from a young child, first days of exposure is average uh, eight to nine years old, all the way through to those who are, are older, elderly, senior in, in life. It is across the board and it goes after everybody and we need to put a stop to it. So um, I think it's one of those things it, it needs to be talked about. But again, as we both know, when it comes to things of a sexual nature, shh, we don't talk about that because we might offend someone. And uh, yeah. you know, we try to be very pastoral um, and 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 gentle, but truthful at the same time and courageous. And uh, we just need to continue to put our hand to the plow and, and keep with it. Just got to keep at it. I mean, in preparing yeah. for preparing for this interview today, I I did some searching and, and uh, looked up some statistics. And a lot of the different sites were reporting on the same sort of studies that have been done over the past 10 or 15 years. And, you know, some of the statistics are, are frightening. Uh, 50% of people uh, access internet pornography while at work, usually often every day at some point. So you talk about how does this affect everybody? That's how it affects everybody. It, it hurts businesses. It creates you know, lost time at work and so on. Then I read our, that our ahead. executive, our executive director at uh, Integrity Restored, Jim O'Day, he was in business um, in the private sector, and he actually wrote a document. It's on our website, IntegrityRestored.com. That's called Exposed, and it's a study on the number of hours and dollars lost um, in business by people watching pornography during the workday. You're you're spot on. Yeah. It's so true. And uh, I, I read that about 10 percent of the respondents of these were sort of self responding people. So you, the numbers are probably even higher. But 10 percent of respondents said that they were addicted to pornography, which counts for millions. Excuse me, I got <clears throat> millions and millions of, of Americans. Yes. You know, are addicted to pornography. If 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 if, you know, if the self referring figure of 10 percent is correct, uh, it's something like 48 to 50 percent of people uh, worldwide access pornography, not just at work, but privately at home uh, almost every day at some point. Uh, as and you've already mentioned, it is a leading contributor to divorces anymore. At least it's one of the one of the big factors that often come up in divorce proceedings. You know, my husband is is addicted to pornography and it's and then there is this skyrocketing rate of sexual uh, of erectile dysfunction among young men. Skyrocketing. Yep. Yes. Uh, and it's got nothing to do with any kind of physical uh, impediment, but it's psychological and emotional that uh, their their you know their significant other their paramour all right their sexual interest does not excite them the way pornography does you know and, and so it's, it's, it's I think it was the, and the crazy part is is again you know when you talk about you know medication for you know erectile dysfunction for the, the little blue pill has been around for a while but now all of a sudden you see all of these other uh, companies pharmaceuticals coming out with this medication. Well, the, yeah. the, it, listen, if there's more medication, there's probably the, there's a growing need. But again, people don't want to put the connection. Why is there no, this growing they don't. need? It's not because, again, like you said, that, that it's a, a physical issue. It's a psychological issue. And it's this rampancy of porn. Yeah. You know, it was the feminist Naomi Wolf who said that uh, what pornography has done is that when now a man sees his naked wife or his naked girlfriend, he views it as bad pornography. <laughs> and that's why he's not excited by it, you know, because yeah. she does not measure up to what he's watching on screen. Uh, yeah. And so the, the sexual encounter just never happens. There's also the, the issue. And you know, for example, I was reading an article about the demographic implosion in Japan, where the Japanese government is now seriously considering actually paying people hefty amounts of money just to have children. And there was a lengthy article, I believe it was on Newsweek magazine online. And I'm sitting they're thinking, well, you know, it's got to have something to do with porn, porn, porn. And the article never mentioned until it got to the very end. And it said, and some people theorize that it might have something to do with the absolute ubiquity of male pornography watching in, 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 among Japanese young men, you know, uh, and, and I think that that's probably got a huge uh, thing to do with it. We're, we're not procreating like we should be. 
because it's not as much fun as as the virtual stuff. And so couples are just not having I was talking with a priest friend of mine who said that you would be shocked, Larry, shocked, even among young people, how many almost completely sexless marriages there are out there. Yeah. Uh, a lot of us you know, go, go going off of those two points. One of them, you know, you talked uh, uh, just a moment ago about, um, you know, the, the sexless marriages. And, um, you know, one is the number of people who eating disorders for women is on the rise. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of making a resurgence again because of how they view themselves in comparison to what their husbands or boyfriends or whoever is looking. I have to look like that. And so there's this, you know, been this. And then the other part of it is, is the amount of sexual violence within marriage it's, and to the point of rape in marriage because it's this desire to reenact what these men are watching on the screen and you know these women live in shame they live in fear they're 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 hurt um you know physically mentally emotionally spiritually um it, it is just it is grave what is happening and it's all because there is just this overflowing um message of you know this is what should you know this is what should be doing this is normal and it's not, and no one wants to talk about, you know, not no one, but there, it, it's very rarely yeah, talked rare. about of all of the harmful effects. Absolutely. I want to go back to something too you said earlier about uh, because of the priest sex abuse scandal yeah. in the church that has now been going on for 20 plus years. Uh, it has affected the church's credibility on sexual matters in the public domain. And that has led many uh, priests, especially in the church, to simply shy away from talking about the church's views on sexuality. You're feeling very reluctant to do so because, you know, what credibility do we have to tell these people? And, and I'm sure they often hear it from parishioners and others. Who are you to tell me what to do with my sexual life when the priesthood itself is so messed up? Uh, but I agree with you. Uh, that only means that the church needs to double down all the more on preaching its 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 message its, its message of sexuality because it's a very healthy message. And the fact of the matter is, and I'll let you talk. The priests, and you know this very very well, uh, but probably better than I because you live in the clerical ranks. The priest sex abuse crisis did not is does not exist in a vacuum, and it did not arise in a vacuum. Priests are human beings; they're the product. Of, of this this pornified culture uh, and and even before the age of internet pornography um, you know it, the the notions of, of sexuality had become very debased in our culture and our society and as in fact I was talking with a couple of seminary formators from two different seminaries who and I was asking them if this was you know an impediment to letting guys into the seminary if they had, had been you know exposed to porn. And they said, Larry, if we turned away seminary candidates based on the fact that they had used or were frequent users of pornography, we would end up with very, very few people in the seminary. We have to let them in and then help them deal with this problem, help them heal from this problem. And my point is simply that's another example of how the church herself is affected by her own reluctance to preach this message, to get this message out here, because it affects not only the broader culture it affects the priesthood itself that these that these, that these things don't get talked about yeah. no you're exactly right and you know the good thing is is i entered the the seminary uh what 21 21 years ago it'll be this fall and you know thank god the seminary formators and formation programs have changed their outlook um on working with this problem because the other thing that I think is so important to say, and it's not just, again, with those in formation, but it's with, with everyone who struggles with this issue, it's not something that can just be prayed away. And, you know, there right. are some people who just want to spiritualize the solution to all of this, but it, it is one facet of multiple facets to be able to address this problem. And I think, you know, there was a time, and again, this comes from, you know, I go, I've gone around the country, I've been able to speak at uh, clergy convocations within dioceses and things like that. And you hear these different priests and, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, uh, I, I went to confession in the seminary and I confessed, you know, uh, pornography and masturbation. And, you know, they told me to, you know, uh, wrap a rosary around my hand because, you know, then I would, <laughs> I, would, I, would I would pray the rosary and Mary would defend me from the evil. And I, and I asked, well, how'd that turn out for you? Not too well. Um, yeah, exactly. Because it wasn't yeah, being yeah. addressed. But now... They are, and they're working together, you know, with you know, psychologists and clinicians, which is, again, our approach as well as at Integrity Restored, 
But I think, you know, the uh, going back to the whole issue of the clergy sexual abuse scandal, you know, in, in that and in this, here's the reality. The blessing of the church is that we have the truth. How human beings right. apply that truth is always where the flaws come in. And so it's not that we don't have the truth about, the, you know, what how, how our sexuality is to be properly used, um, how the priesthood is supposed to be properly lived, how we're supposed to def defend and protect the innocence of minors, um, along with every other truth that we preach. We have that truth, we've had that truth, and we will always have that truth. But it all depends on human beings, one by one, choosing to live that truth out. And that's the difference. So you know what? If, if yeah. you're going to live the truth, you have to live the whole truth um, because it all works in concert with one another. And so, you know, you can't find yourself, you know, as especially as a priest being called to be that altar Christus, that other Christ in the world. Yeah. But then, you know, when Jesus says in the Gospels, let the children come to me, you know, that we're going to shy away from kids. You know, there has to be a proper integration on the part of the man to then go into the world and to be that reflection and that person of Christ in, in the lives of others. And, and it's crucial. Yeah. We need it more than ever today. So I think, you know, the, the, the devil will always be, you know, use uh, the fallenness and weakness of man to be able to suppress the truth. Uh, he, he, he hates nothing more um, than the truth about who God is and, and that, you know, the devil is not God and can't be. Um, and so I, I think that our ability to continue to proclaim that truth boldly, but with sensibility, with, uh, with you, it, it's boldness, but it's pastoral, um, it's yeah. sensible, and you're able to go out into the world and to be effective with that. And we, we, have, yeah. we have great truth to tell that could transform people's lives. And we bear witness to it all the time. But, you know, just because, you know, some among us have failed in in living out that truth properly does not mean that we fold up and walk away. It means that we have more work to do to make sure that our foundation is strong, that the boundaries that we have are stronger, but that also at the same time, yeah. and like you made this connection too, you know, when we look at the, the, the modern age, you know, those who are committing sins against, uh, you know, and, and crimes against minors, um, how many of them, you know, were had crimes committed against them as minors, sexual crimes as minors, yes. and then also the influence of pornography. Again, make the connections because it all works together. We we come out as a society and we say X, or, you know, this is wrong. Okay, but do we do we have the willingness and and the, the again the courage to go back and say, but what were the underpinnings that that brought out this wrong and this offense and this crime and this sin? Let's go fix that. I talk about this oftentimes in confession with people. People come into confession and they want to lop off the weed at the surface level. And I said, what's going to happen? The weed's going to grow back. Yeah. What do we have to do? We have to get into the root system and get out the root of the problem and then no weed. And you know, the same yeah. thing is we have the truth to be able to come and to eradicate not only the weed, but also the root. But we have to be courageous with it and we have to bring it into the lives of people and make those connections. Yeah. And uh, I like what you said about you just can't pray it away uh, oh. and, and that you have to use there has it has to be a multi pronged effort to present the church's truth, because the church's truth on this matter is not simply a white knuckled asceticism saying, no, don't do that because that brings you sexual pleasure and therefore that's bad. Uh, that, that's not going to work. I mean, certain natural law arguments about why masturbation is immoral are, of course, necessary. They're a baseline. But when you start telling people. I mean, and, and let's face it. I mean, one of the essential immoral qualities of uh, pornography is that it involves masturbatory sex. And a lot of people don't really get why masturbatory sex is, is immoral, why it's wrong, why it in fact is harmful and dangerous. They just don't get that. And so Especially the message doctors say it's healthy. Yeah. And the message that comes across is, well, then this is just the church telling me that something that's very natural and very, very pleasurable is wrong. How typical that's all the church wants is to tell me that sexual pleasure is wrong. And then, of course, they drag out uh, the fallacy, the logical fallacy of statistical frequency, you know, like 90 percent of adult people masturbate, you know, on a regular basis. Therefore, how wrong can it be? Is God sending all those people to hell? Well, no. But, you know, also, you know, 95 percent of people probably lie on a daily basis, you know, uh, white lies, whatever. The statistical frequency of an action in some ways not only does not argue against its immorality, but perhaps argues for why we need to double down on talking about why it's wrong. 
if that many people are doing things that are wrong and destructive, all the more reason for us to wave a flag and say, no, 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 here's the problem. And the key, though, is, is it's got to be a holistic approach. It, like I said, it just can't be this white knuckled asceticism. It has to involve psychology. And, and also, it's got to be not simply negative, negative, negative. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. It has to be within the uh, uh, an overarching theology that's quite fetching and beautiful. It's holistic. So, for example, you talk to them about, you know, as, as St. Paul says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So you begin to talk about that you are sacred and your body is sacred. And I'm sure you, you, you off screen, you told me you were teaching theology of the body for uh, eighth graders, you know, and I'm sure that's, that's a big part of it. The sacramentality of our bodies, well, you know, we and, 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 about, and we were just talking about this and, and I want to put into context of something that when we, especially when I go out and speak with uh, parents and teachers and school administrators, it, it, it's oftentimes something that we miss the importance of and that you were just articulating, but I want to just sort of put into terms. Go ahead. Yeah. We say, we say when, when you're talking to young people about this, you can't just be against the bad, but you also have to be about the good. Yes. And we have this tendency within the church, whether it's through an examination of conscience or just how people look upon confession, for instance, or just rule and law in general, that it's, the, the, the church or the, the the law saying bad, 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 don't do what is bad. But the, the, we especially in today's day and age with young people, because of that overarching question of why and wanting to understand, we also have to say, here is why with the, the good that we're about. Here is what's virtuous. Here is what's beautiful. Here is the intention from God as the creator of how your body is supposed to be used, of how your sexuality is supposed to be used in a healthy and productive way. So, you know, across the board, it, it is important. And, and it's something that I myself, even as I go out, you know, and sometimes you're deal you come from a situation of working with someone who is heavily in, you know, addicted to porn, and then you're you're transferring over, you know, trying to bring about the good news into people's lives about this issue to prevent it. And, you know, again, you can get into the, you know, this person just went down such a dark road and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. But at the same time, even within that context of helping the person who's addicted, you have to shine that light of not just saying you shouldn't do this because it's wrong, but you should also be aiming towards this virtuous life because of what it brings to, to you, yeah. to your soul, to your overall salvation. Yeah. And that's a message that has to get out. And the, the problem is, is people often think, well, that just means we need to uh, preach from the pulpit on this more. But the problem is, is that talking about things like this aren't necessarily all the, the you know, the homily is often not the best place to be airing this. You may you can use euphemisms and you can talk, you know, in circles and so on. But you've got young people in a congregation. You know this better than I. Well, here, here's the thing, though. I, and I, I would just say this. And this is for the benefit of my brother. priest. You have to be prudent in your preaching. But my people know. They know first and foremost, um, you know, the specialized ministry that I'm involved in, I'm involved in, and also that from time to time, the word pornography in the context of a homily will issue from my mouth. And you know, again, being sensible about it, I've never yeah. ha once had someone call me, call the the diocese. Good. Say, Can you believe that this priest is 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 talking about pornography? Now, maybe some have said this to themselves, but they would be foolish to think such because here's the thing: being worried about children. You have a very thin, small age range from the moment of being under, able to actually, you know, hear and understand that this priest said in his homily the word pornography to the age where first exposure is common, is common, right. which is eight to nine years old. Yes. So you're talking about between maybe a kindergartner to a second grader. Um, you know, right there, that that's the the sort of the OK, well, you know what, we'll we'll talk about it and just say, you know, there are great people out there who are working on things alongside with us. Um, there's a, a, something I always recommend to parents, which is the um, the website and organization Defend Young Minds. And they have a book that's called they have two books. One is called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. And then there's Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, Junior. Junior, we, we always tell people is for around kindergarten. And then the 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 regular is for like second grade. And it's it's to start already then talking about that. We'll, we'll talk about this later when we talk about, you know, working with young people, because, you know, the whole birds and bees talk is out the window and it's the it's the whole adolescent conversation that we need to focus on. Um, but, you know, just go, going back to the, the point that you were making there, 
I, I think that you know our uh, ability to be able to uh, address this, um, you know, and and with, with with again prudence in in the context of the homily, it has to come out. But then it carries over into you know even you know as I go around and speak to priests, you know, there's helpful tips in the confessional because you don't want the confessional to turn into spiritual direction. But there is that brief moment where you have the opportunity to just make that invitation for the person to transition from the confessional to the office where you're having the conversation to be able to get them the help that they need. Again, right. you know, taking in all the precautions that it's, you know, not connected to their penance and their forgiveness and all this kind of stuff. Um, but that, you know, it is something is available. And here's the thing. If someone comes to the point where they have the courage to bring this into confession, eventually, if it's repetitive and addictive, they will have the courage also to come and see the priest or, you know, who will hopefully then get them to a clinician to be able to get them the help and healing that they need. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a good point, too, about, you know, the very narrow age range. Uh, yes. I, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, but then there's also other venues. I mean, there's uh, Catholic schools, there's catechism classes, there's marriage preparation. Uh, I know a priest, who, you know, I, I think it's now defunct, but he at one time had, you know, a support group for pornography addiction in his parish and so on. So there are a lot of things that that, that can be done. Even uh, in the context of like we were going back and talking about, or we were talking about the clergy sexual abuse scandal. Um, one of the things that we're going to be working on in our diocese with our safe environment office, you know, with all the protecting God's children and, and youth protection programs and stuff, is to also bring to the light to those who are in charge of youth um, the evils of pornography. Because here's the thing, while, you know, again, very blatant, you know, you as an adult and who's watching over young people should not be using pornography, but you also have to catch the the, the signs of them viewing it as well. Um, you know, I say this all the time, you know, like, for instance, a CYO coach, you know, OK, practice ends five minutes early. Um, you know, the kids automatically want to go for their phones. OK, well, they're up there sitting on the bleachers. Maybe there's an open Wi-Fi network or something like that. They're hopping on it. And guess what's accessible to them? Porn. And so, you know, in that in that, you have to understand that if there's this over, you know, the, the, and, and it, moderation, you know, we are yeah. definitely not an organization and I'm not a person who sits there and says, get rid of all technology. The technology is bad. Yeah. Say that, but it, it does have to be taught how to properly use it. And even things like safe environments need to have uh, safe environment programs need to have an understanding that there are all of these different things connected and we need to be vigilant. So as much as just like I, I tell people all the time, the new the the stranger danger. You know, you used to watch videos about stranger danger, about the creepy man in the van, you know, by the park. Stranger danger is no longer about a creepy man in a van on the park. It's the creepy man who's trying to lure children in through the video games and yeah, through yeah, and absolutely. social media, trying to you know get them to you know do things that that you know that they shouldn't be and things that are harmful to them. And we need to teach, you know, proper use of the Internet, you know, have um, firewalls set up properly for the Internet, you know, within Wi-Fi systems and stuff like that. And parental controls on devices. So, so crucial. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would, you know, you can put pornography blockers on your Wi-Fi. That's that's one yep. thing a parent can do. Exactly. But then also what a parent uh, I didn't even think about this. Uh, but uh, I had one parent tell me that they also then eliminated the data plan off their child's phone because the data plan can bypass the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, correct. Yeah. And so then th there's no blockers then uh, on the data plan. Or you can, I guess, install software on a phone so that a parent can watch what their child has been viewing uh, on their smartphone. I want to track it, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong about that, but I think such software does exist. Um, that allows a certain amount of prayer. But that, that then segues into, okay, a couple of things. Uh, you know, we've got maybe a half an hour left to us here. Uh, I want to talk about, what, well, what exactly is it that you do or you recommend people do in, in, in addressing with young people this issue of pornography, like in, in these various uh, groups? And, and then also, what is it that parents can do? We've already sort of hit on that a little bit, but what is it that, that a parent could do? But let's start with what, what, what is it that you do with young people in a sort of concrete way? So one of the things is that, that we talk about is making sure that the, the, what used to be considered as the birds and the bees talk, um, that either, you know, for, for a lot of us, we either didn't get, we got, and it was poorly done. 
um, or, you know, very few can actually look back and say, you know, my parents, the people who were in charge of, you know, forming me as a, as a youth, um, did a good job of explaining sex and sexuality to me. And yeah, now- I'll interrupt you for a second. But when I was a kid, sex education for me was part A goes into part B and sometimes part C, a baby comes out, you know, yes. that's it. Yes. There, there was my education. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, living in that world, you know, number one, again, when you talk about first exposure, eight, nine years old to pornography, the trauma that comes with that, and that's a big word, you know, that we talk about in this ministry is, is working with trauma. Um, But the, the, since that is the, the first touch point, eight and nine years old, there has to be, I call the consistent conversation because it leaves an openness for children to be able to talk to their parents when they see or experience or hear something which again, let's face it, you know, no matter where you're going to school, you know, I I always say the sin abounds, whether you're in a public, private, you know, or even in a homeschool situation, um, sin is still there knocking at the door, devil is trying to get into your life. But there is a difference of how we respond to it. But children are constantly being inundated with all different types of ideologies each and every day. And so it, it becomes all the more important that parents can assume that, you know, everything that I want my child to become to grow into is being handled at school we can't trust that anymore i'm just across the board and it doesn't have to do even necessarily with the fact of 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 the administration or the teacher it has to do just with the the availability to all of the different ideologies that the other classmates have that they're bringing from their own home you know you know um and again this gets into all different situations of you know uh you know, whether, you know, it's it's a nuclear family or you have, you know, transgender, you know, realities and, and yeah. all of that stuff. We could talk, you know, about a whole, whole multi other sessions about that. But I think it's the, the consistent conversation is what is so important for families to be able to have that with their children. And that age appropriately, they talk about, you know, here is the, the purpose of your body. Here is the purpose of your human sexuality. And, you know, that's where you start to, from a very early age, once they, you know, once they get in, in sort of interested or invited into a, a sexuality that is selfish, um, when you talked about like, you know, masturbation and stuff like that, or the viewing of pornography that is so self-centered, children already have a baseline to say, no, my body wasn't you meant for that. My, you know, the gift of my sexuality isn't meant for that. It's meant to be something that is good. It's meant to be used for good. And I need to use it as such. And so I think that's one of the biggest things that, you know, I, as I go around and talk to parents about, you know, giving them the truth about, you know, the, the rampant availability of pornography and things like that, and about parental controls um, and things like that with devices and stuff that, that big piece of the consistent conversation is so very important because it keeps the lines of communication open between them and Again, there. When you talk about trauma points with viewing pornography for the first time, uh, eight nine years old, whether it's through curiosity or they get caught in clickbait or someone forces it upon them or whatever the case may be, that's a traumatic moment for a child, and they're already stricken with the fact that they don't know what to do with what they've seen, what they've heard, um, what's been done, and now they don't feel that there's an open line of communication. You know, and again saying things and fostering things in the mind of a child are two different things. You know, you can always talk to me, you can always talk to me versus really, you know, just getting, it's not only against the bad, but about the good and talking, you know, scenarios, you know, and, and yeah. letting the child know because it is so mainstream. If this happens or something like this happens, you can come to me. I love you. I care about you, you know? And so parents need to continue to cultivate that in their child and, for all the efforts yeah. that's put in into getting them to all of their practices and their recitals and their games and all of this stuff, all like you said about that student that you had in class, all of that's well and good. Um, but if they're struggling with this behind the scenes, you're going to start to see their productivity diminish. Their their success is going to diminish um, because of this. I, I always tell teachers, if you start to see Johnny or Susie, you know, 30 years ago, I could, I remember, you know, around, you know, when I was growing up as, as a kid and you stopped doing your homework or, you know, something, oh, you're, you're just choosing to be lazy. Now there are, we have such a better understanding of the mind and child development that there are so many things in this whole issue of pornography being one of them where they start to detach, where they start to turn inward yeah. and everything around them that they used to be good at, that they used to love continue or starts to disappear. 
So taking an investment in our, our young people with education and prevention is so crucial in this day and age, just because of you know the, the counter ideologies of this is normal, it's okay. Um, but then all of a sudden when it happens to their child, they're completely horrified. Well, how about we pre be preventative for the sake of your child's wholeness, goodness, and just overall integrity? Yeah, hey, uh, that is such great advice. And and I, you know, haven't been a parent myself. Uh, I still am, but my daughter's an adult now. But uh, the thing is, is that a couple of things. Never assume that just because you have a, a wholesome Catholic household that your child is therefore going to be immune to these temptations. Uh, because if one thing we've learned over the past, you know, 20, 30 years is, is that the mere presence of whole, a wholesome Catholic environment is, is no guarantee that people are not going to succumb to this. Mm -hmm. But also, too, I mean, this would just be my recommendation to parents that if you if your child does come to you voluntarily with this as a problem or you catch them doing it, which I think is more often than not what happens, you, you see it on their phone, you, you, whatever, not to shame them or punish them for it. Uh, because more than likely, they're already feeling a sense of shame about it. And more than likely, they already know instinctively that there's something not quite right about this. Uh, they've succumbed to temptation because they're young and for want of a better word, horny, you know, and, and concupiscence got the best of them. And so at that point, you need to be non-judging, non-punitive, non-harsh, and to simply sit down and in a very understanding way, talk to your child about it. Mm -hmm. um, but that then requires that you already have a good relationship with your child, with open lines of communication on a whole range. A whole, right. It can't just be on, okay, we, now we need to talk about sex because I, I caught some dirty pictures on your phone. Uh, that's not going to work if you don't talk about your child with just, you know, about almost everything. Because here's the trouble, and you know this. You know this probably even better than I do. The natural inclination of adolescence in our culture, I don't want to speak across cultures, but in our culture is to hide things, to be mm -hmm. secretive, yes. to not want their parents to know what's going on in their life. Forget the sexuality stuff. I remember when I was an adolescent boy, I was reading books about theology and philosophy, and I, I didn't want my parents to know that. I, I tried to hide these books from them because I don't know why, but, you know, we grew up as Catholics even, but I just didn't want my, my mom and dad thinking that I was some kind of a little nerd, you know, sitting in my room reading. So the point is, here was a perfectly good thing to be doing, but I wanted to keep it a secret from my parents because that was, you know. So this is the natural inclination of adolescence already is to carve out your own niche as a person separate from that of your parents. And that requires a certain bubble of secrecy. Uh, you know, why adolescents keep their rooms locked and don't go in my room and all that. And it's got nothing to do necessarily with there's drugs in there or porn. It's just got they don't want you in their room. Yeah. Um, but in some sense, this is one area where parents, I think, without being harsh, judgmental or punitive, have to be intrusive. Don't you agree? And I think I, I think the other thing you're right. And I think one of the first things and, and I've preached about this many times is this whole reality of shame. Because we have to remember and keep in perspective the difference between shame and guilt. And, and you know, whether it's working with someone who has been in, who is using, who is addicted, a uh, person who feels the betrayal trauma um, of someone else's use, um, or it, it, there's so many multiple facets to this. I always remind people, guilt is about what we've done and shame is about who we are. And, you know, our, our, our God, our, our loving God is not a God of shame. Is it good that we feel guilt about what we've done? Yes, it is important that we feel guilt because guilt then, you know, pushes us into corrective action um, and pushes us into the, for instance, the confessional and restitution for things that we've done, et cetera. But this whole thing about shame just starts, starts to distort who I am as a son or a daughter of a loving father. And so we live in we live in a culture that oftentimes in many different households and, and this sometimes is cultural, um, et cetera, use shame as a motivator. You know, the worst thing that you could ever do was to bring shame to your family. And I always tell parents the worst thing that you could ever say to your child is that you are ashamed of them because it starts to distort exactly who they are. And the devil loves to right. use that as a tool to change our identity of, of who we are. And the other piece of this is then, okay, so, 
you know, what stops parents from really, you know, having the, the army that they need or the village that they need to help raise their child is shame. They're ashamed. They're, first of all, their child is ashamed because of what they've seen and they don't know how to handle. Now the parent finds out about it. They, 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 they use the shame on their child, but then they also have a certain amount of shame about, you know, who they are as parents and that we failed and we could never go and share this with other parents because then we would look bad. But guess what? All of those other parents are dealing with this same threat that you are. And the more that you're able to bond together and talk about this, the more that you yeah. have a fighting chance for the sake of your children. Interestingly enough, there was a video when I first got into this, and it's sort of a little dated, but and yet at the same time, some people just don't know as much about technology, so it's still very uh, current and, and real. A Catholic Mutual, who a lot of dioceses have as their insurance carrier, uh, put out um, this uh, this video talking about the importance of internet safety um, and putting firewalls up. And it talked about uh, it showed two uh, parents, um, you know, two moms. Uh, they were, you know, they're they're the two their individual sons. The one mom had them out for soccer practice or something like that. So she brings them home, drops them off. They go out back and are playing, and the two moms are talking together. And they started talking about a recipe or something like that. And so the the mom whose home it, it was, she goes on to look on the internet and she goes, oh, that's interesting. She said, uh, you know, I had it here in my history, but now my history is blank. I wonder how that happened. And the, the mom who was visiting, like the light bulb goes on and she's like, does your son have access to that computer? And she's like, yeah, let me tell you what happened in our house. And they, you know, found out that their son was viewing pornography and the way that he was getting around it on the family computer was that he knew how to erase the history. So they were none the wiser until they caught it. And then they had the conversation. Then they, they talked about, you know, they, they also had to talk with their parish priest and stuff because, you know, and the mom said, I had to get over my shame about all of this because what was first and foremost was the help that I needed for my child. And now she's passing it and she had the courage to pass it on to this mom to say, there's a good chance, you know, it could have been a technical glitch, but let's face it, there's also a good chance that yeah. you're going to be looking at pornography and knows how to, you know, erase the history or even on the phone or whatever the case may be. So yeah, I think these things are, it's very, it, it, there's so many different tentacles and, and levels to this web. Oh, there really are, you know, and I, I, I'm going to use an analogy with sort of, uh, you know, smoking pot, smoking marijuana, weed. All right. And uh, after decades of, uh, you know, I grew up in the 60s. So, of course, that's when the sort of weed culture sort of got started even before then. But it sort of exploded onto the scene in the 60s with the whole hippie drug culture. You know, by the time I became, you know, an adult and, and you know, and, and my friends were all adults and having children, what you were dealing with then was were a generation of parents uh, who had smoked weed when they were adolescents and mm -hmm. in their early 20s. So when their own children then reached that same age, they were able to say to them, look, I did the same thing. I smoked what you're smoking. OK, and here's why. Once again, in a non shaming, non punitive way, they could just lay out. Here's why I quit doing that, because here's what we did to me. And here are the bad things that happened to me because I was constantly in a weed high. All right. And that has an impact, doesn't it? When your parent comes to you and says, I've been down this road, buddy, and here's what's going to happen to you. Now we have a generation of parents coming up who are probably many of them watching pornography when, when they were in their teen years and early 20s and forth, who then maybe overcame it and can need now then to overcome the shame of having to admit to their kid. Yeah, I did that stuff too when I was your age. And here's why I don't think you should do it because X, Y, Z negative consequences. So in some sense, there can be a silver lining to the fact that we're now dealing with a generation of parents who have been exposed to pornography themselves and have used it themselves and hopefully have overcome it. Right. Yes. Yeah. And hopefully the ones who see it as a problem um, because of what their experience was and aren't passing on the, well, I did it. So it's okay for you to do it. Right. Um, because, you know, the, the, by, by some type of, you know, sexual utilitarian, you know, whatever, it just, it's, it's crazy. Well, and you saw the same thing to, to push the analogy again of weed smoking. There are parents who react just like that and say, well, I smoked weed when I was, I'm not going to say anything. It's harmless. Yeah. I'll just let him do it. And so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, you, you have that phenomenon too. So, okay. So, 
all that being said, let's turn back to young people themselves here and advice that we can give them. Say, uh, uh, you know, somebody in their teen years or maybe all, even all the way up into adulthood, into their 40s and 50s, maybe their 60s watching this show, uh, know that they have a problem with pornography. To where do they turn? I mean, obviously, you can go to confession and those sorts. But it, what if they want deeper help? Uh, you know, uh, that kind of thing. What what sort of in other words, what platforms are out there for them to access? What yeah. what programs, what sorts of things? Yeah. So uh, one, I would direct people directly to our website, uh, integrityrestore.com um, or uh, our diocesan uh, website as well, which is connected with uh, the um, Lumen Christi. Or I'm sorry, with Integrity Restored, which is our ad lumenchristi.com. Uh, um, but right there, we have a lot of resources to be able to get people into what what is it help to them. Again, it's for those who want to understand and get an education. It's for those who are currently struggling, and it's for those who are affected by another person's struggle. And you know, we have all things from you know, for instance, and I'd like to you know get some time to talk about this before we end. Um, be betrayal trauma. Um, and let's again, talk about that. Yeah, while, while it's while it's growing in. Um, while it's grow pornography is a growing issue for women, um, it is a, a larger part, you know, a reality for men, but then you have to take into account their spouse. So we have, for instance, uh, Bloom for Catholic Women. Um, I just, uh, there's a, a woman by the name of Dee Arison and her sister, Lara Ercolino from You Are Made New Ministries. And uh, we just got done doing a segment on Friday night. It was sort of like Friday night date night um, from 7.30 to 9.30 with couples. Um, who they were struggling um, with their with pornography has affected their marriage. And so we were on there to talk about, you know, what marriage should look like and especially how to uh, start on that road and pathway to healing um, when betrayal trauma has been found out. So that's definitely one. There's coaching, um, both on the side of helping people to have the knowledge uh, for accountability, uh, to be accountability coaches and things like that, and then to also um, you know, bring the truth into the lives of people who are struggling with pornography use um, and have, you know, the, that, that accountability from someone who is coaching them to a better way of living. Um, I think one of the other things is, is and this is where we encourage people to um, have their priests reach out and even to have their priests go to their vicars for clergy and their bishops. Um, one of the things that we offer through in, uh, Integrity Restored is a clergy intensive. It's a three and a half day uh, intensive with both myself as, as a priest and also uh, Peter Kloponis as a clinician, um, where we come and, and equip priests with sort of a, a more in-depth understanding of this issue and tools that they need as pastoral counselors, um, as confessors, and you know as pastors of souls uh, to be able to address this. And one of the biggest pieces is the ability to, what I call at least, to do the triage. We're all, you know, understanding of, you know, the triage reality with, you know, our, our physical bodies and, and our physical health. Um, when we go to the ER or someone is on site, you know, and, and triaging, a, triaging a situation. Well, in the same way, one of the things that we're equipped to do is to be able to triage and to be able to direct a person um, into sort of what situation they're experiencing in the moment. Because, again, people love to throw around terms. And I get, you know, very uh, worried when you, you have, for instance, someone who may have been, you know, uh, had, had, had been had been a streak of maybe using, you know, three or four times pornography in a month. And then all of a sudden something clicks or someone says something to them and they're coming to you and say, Father, I'm a porn addict. Well, hold on. We're not going to get into self-diagnosis here. Um, let's understand your situation. And then we'll start to direct you in the proper places of where to go. And, you know, one of the things that we definitely subscribe to is the balance between um, you know, the spiritual component and the pastoral uh, accompaniment, along with the clinician, um, giving the proper things that are needed from, a, a, you know, a mental health perspective and, and, and that guidance. So I think that that's also, you know, a big piece. Um, but there, there is more and more that is being done. And, you know, like I said, my, yeah. my colleague, Dr. Peter Clopone, his practice is growing. Um, we look at, uh, there are uh, psychologists out there, we uh, CSAT, Clinical sex addiction um, therapist uh, is one of the, the the it's sort of like the Cadillac version of qualification to be able to deal with this issue. People who deal with trauma, people who deal with addiction, um, to be able to help on that clinical side. 
And then, you know, again, we're just continuing to grow this out more and more. So there is a lot of help out there for people. And a lot of times it just has to do with the courage um, to be able to reach out and to say, I have a problem. Once you open that door, the wealth of help that we can get to you is there. It, it is there. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we throw the word addiction around rather loosely sometimes in talking about, oh, porn addiction. Mm -hmm. And yet this, some of those same studies that I was reviewing before I came on with you today said, yeah, 10% of respondents sort of self-report, yes, I, I'm addicted to pornography. But what the experts are saying is that the actual percentage of people that are truly addicted in the clinical sense of addiction is, is not nearly as high as that. Uh, addiction is seen as a truly deep psychological obsession and compulsion that completely overwhelms the will of a person to resist uh, is, is not the same thing as somebody who has simply developed an ingrained bad habit of giving in to lust and concupiscence. Right. Uh, there is a distinction to be made between those two things. And in that regard, I would like to bring up, even though we have both emphasized that you simply can't pray this away, which is a way of saying that superficial pieties are not going to work in, in overcoming a deeply ingrained vice or habit like this. And that isn't true of almost all of our vices that are deeply ingrained, or, or regard, even the non-sexual ones. Uh, and, so, and so what I would say is, you know, what then, in other words, in order to help us overcome not addictions, but simply a deeply ingrained vice of giving into concupiscence, what spiritual pathways should we pursue then? Because it would seem that the soil of my spiritual life has got to be made better, all right, if I'm going to overcome those kinds of temptations of concupiscence. I, I don't mean to put you on the spot if you don't have a ready-made answer for this. No, I do, I do, I do, because again, yeah. this has become so much a part of my life. And I think the, the two things that I want to talk about there is, is helpers and also um, refuge. And, you know, the helpers, uh, I'm going to hit four. Uh, three of them are, are related in the archangels. Um, they are actually our patron saints of this work, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. Um, one, Michael, uh, is, you know, this victor over evil, um, over, over the evil of Satan. And so we need Michael's invocation to help us to have the courage to battle against this evil. Two, Gabriel is the proclaimer of good news, um, you know, the incarnation and, you know, our ability to be able to share the truth uh, about the, about, again, being about the good, about who we are, who we're called to be and what we're capable of doing. And the fact that there is help out there for those who are struggling and then the third is Raphael. And I always say, you know, as you well know, Raphael, since he's from the Old Testament, sort of gets a, 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 a low grade uh, rep um, out there because, uh, you know, uh, doesn't not as well known as, as Michael and, and Gabriel. But Raphael, you know, has that beautiful uh, piece of healing. And, and we need to do yeah. that. You know, we're, we're, we're not we're not about shunning people off to the great abyss where they have, you know, nowhere to go. Um, you know, and Raphael is there to to remind us that God is a healer and that Jesus is our divine physician and that he, you know, can definitely help us, you know, in this regard. So those three, um, and actually I'm going to do, so those three together, and then on either side of them, um, I'm, I was staying with the saints uh, first for the four, uh, is our Blessed Mother, okay? Um, Mom wants all of her children uh, to be holy and healthy. And so, you know, she who stomped on the head of the serpent, um, you know, the new Eve, she is ready to be that assistance to us um, as we battle this. But then also sort of a new person who's come out onto the scene. Um, I don't know if you saw this. I think it was in an article uh, from a Catholic news agency, I think, last week. Uh, but uh, Blessed Carlo Acutis. Um, oh, yeah. About his wonderful use of the Internet, you know, for especially bringing um, devotion to the Eucharist and the truth of the faith. And, you know, the, the juxtaposition is using the Internet for things that are evil. And so... Uh, Blessed Carlo Acutis has come out as sort of this new patron. I'm actually uh, leading a pilgrimage um, to Assisi or to Italy, um, Rome and Assisi in Florence uh, in June. And I'm looking very much forward to taking some per time of personal prayer at the tomb of Blessed Carlo Acutis uh, to be able to ask that blessing over you know, my ministry, but also over all those who are struggling with pornography. So from a spiritual point standpoint there, that's one. The other thing is, when we talk about that definition of addiction, it's someone who goes to find refuge in something that is unhealthy. And so with the spiritual life, it's um, 
it's taking refuge in something that is healthy, especially something that is spiritually beneficial. And while I made that, you know, quip of, you know, earlier talking to guys in the seminary about the reference to the rosary, um, you know, the rosary is a powerful tool. And, you know, yeah. from a spiritual perspective to pray the rosary is is very, very important. Again, asking Mary's intercession and, of course, looking at our Lord and, and his life and his ministry. But I think the, the other thing uh, when we get into, you know, just our prayer life, for instance, one of the things that especially in working, you know, with priests who are struggling with, uh, you know, pornography addiction um, and, and just, you know, or the bad habit or the use is we, we find that these priests who have left priestly ministry have neglected their spiritual life. Uh, they haven't gone on retreat. They aren't, um, you know, praying the bereavery. And I know for a number of priests, you know, there there has been a direct connection that, you know, they're they're not praying the bravery and they're using that time, you know, to, you know, unfortunately <laughs> be born. And I think it's a thing of listen, there the church has provided these things for us to be able to give us a, an opportunity to focus ourselves. And the bravery is is one of those things that I always tell, you know, brother priests, take refuge in that bravery. Um, it is a help to you know to and I know for myself even just in being in dealing with these different things and you can get overwhelmed, you know, sometimes. And, you know, just like the confessional, you know, you, you know, John Vianney, all these people, you know, bringing these sins and stuff, but you have to take care of your own spiritual life and spiritual well-being. And so, you know, getting in there, um, uh, you know, to, to the breviary. And again, the breviary is something, you know, the liturgy, the hours, Christian yeah, prayer yeah. is something that, you know, the lay faithful can pray as well. And the, the one of the ones that I've also found that's been very important is the litany of humility. Because one of the things that can that can come about is is pride. Pride can well well up with addiction. Um, that a person thinks that they have it all under control when they are actually completely out of control. And it, it's a need for us to be more humble uh, and our need to you know want. Um, I I have always you know I've gone back and forth and um one of my favorite singer songwriters um you know over the course of of history uh in or in recent history has been Audrey Assad and. Um, she's actually spoken out about her own pornography addiction. Um, there's a, a really great thing out there now. She's been on a little bit of a, a, a rough stretch and stuff like that, but she has this song called I, Sh I Shall Not Want, and it's based off of the litany of humility. And in the, in the chorus, it says, when I taste your goodness, I shall not want. And so um, also, you know, of course, the mass and, and the Eucharist, but Eucharistic adoration yeah. as well. Um, just Powerful. That, to, to taking refuge in Jesus during that time. I'm glad you brought up the Eucharist because I, I did once hear give a, a priest give a magnificent homily on retreat once, and he brought up the issue of, of pornography, obsession, addiction, you know, sinfulness. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he emphasized was in, in, in combating this on the spiritual level is developing a deep and profound Eucharistic devotion and spirituality because we are never more intimate with christ than we are when we receive him in the eucharist mm -hmm. uh, and and to in a sense view it that way as a kind of intimate you know not sexual obviously but an intimate right. relationship with with our lord uh in this very physical way the real presence of christ in the eucharist and to and, and then to couple that with your body as a temple of the holy spirit and that when you begin to develop this spiritual pathway you begin to realize more and more and more that viewing pornography and masturbation and these sorts of things are barriers to that eucharistic intimacy Yes. that they thwart and block that. And the more you develop this thirst to take the Lord in, you know, in communion and to adore him in adoration, the less you're going to want to replace that intimacy with, with, with sort of pornographic intimacy. In, in that, in that workshop that I was doing on Friday night with uh, the, the folks at Hope's Garden and, and you were made new ministries. That was actually, you know, two of the pieces that I spoke about was emotional and spiritual intimacy. And Very how good. important that, you know, how important that is, um, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Larry, I wanted to, um, you know, just talk the last piece about uh, the betrayal trauma, um, because yes. this is sort of yes. become, in all of my colleagues within our Integrity Restored family, um, it's become a piece that I've really focused in on. Um, and it's been in working with these trauma healing retreats uh, with the, the ladies over at Your May New Ministries, Hope's Garden, um, in, you know, the, you know, the, you have these spouses who are none the wiser of their spouse's use of pornography. And then all of a sudden, 
um, you know, the, the day of revelation comes and it is just crushing. Um, it's crushing. And we've had a number of retreats, some of them virtual, some of them in person um, for uh, women who are just feeling this, oh, this overwhelming pain, um, this betrayal uh, by their spouse. And, you know, it speaks to the, the reality of us not to live compartmentalized lives, because one of the things that we've learned, and this goes on both sides, it goes to the things, and we sort of made reference to this earlier, that contribute to person's addiction or, you know, use or habit, um, but also to the pieces with this betrayal trauma, is the family of origin stuff that is at the base point of our, our, our experience in life, and that, you know, stays with us, even though it might be repressed that things can generate, um, you know, later on. So, you know, in, in working with women who have felt this betrayal trauma, um, you know, a lot of times the trigger of their spouse's revelation takes them back to pains that they experienced in their family of origin that were never resolved, that they again suppressed right. or, 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 or just looked past. And now it comes all back up again. And so we need to work with that first. And then we need to walk along that path and get into, you know, all situations for, um, you know, their, uh, for, for their spouse to stop using uh, the pornography, getting into a plan of treatment, you know, working with their clinician, making sure that there's, uh, you know, counseling for the spouse, for the user, uh, for them together in their marriage, and really taking things in a structured way to be able to heal this. So, you know, I think one of the other messages maybe is as much as we're about, you know, the education prevention and the intervention for those who are using Healing applies, of course, to the user as well, but healing also has to apply um, to those who are affected. And, you know, sometimes it's parents affected by their children's use. Sometimes it's, you know, a, a significant other, even a friend. A lot of times it's a spouse. And again, while it's rising in women, it's the men who are the primary users and then these wives who are harmed. And there's hope and help out there for you as well. And that, I, that betrayal trauma has just become a real big thing that's come to the forefront and we need to address it because, you know, the, some of these folks, they're, they're, they're suffering in silence. Um, they're suffering in fear. They're suffering in embarrassment yeah. and suffering in shame. And it, it's not meant for them. Um, you know, and, you know, there's the other thing that has become a, an interesting point, And I might be ending on so, somewhat of a, a, a controversial topic, but I be, believe firmly on this in my heart. I, I I speak to my brother priests, um, and you know sometimes we come out with you know an idealism um, that isn't tempered by the the real lived experience of our people um, and and what's going on out there in the world. But we found this trend that there are women out there whose husbands are heavily addicted to porn, have no intention of stopping, and after multiple attempts at counseling and things like that. Um, you know, have have just, they, they don't care, they're going to continue to do this, and their wives just have to deal with it as though they're some type of concubine or slave. And the, these women live in suffering, and sometimes they go to their priest, and they're like, we know, we've been through all of this, and Father, I, you know, I really, I, I think that our marriage is over. And I think that, you know, divorce, you know, might be necessary, and of course, I would intend to have an annulment. And priests say, no. You you must never leave your marriage. You are to be in that marriage forever. Yeah. Um, what God has joined must never be divided, and you must stay. And my sort of tagline to this is is that God calls us to sacrifice, not to suicide. And I, I think that that's a very important reality um, to understand too for those experiencing betrayal trauma out there. There has to be a willingness on your spouse's um, part to want to change their behavior. And after repeated attempts. If they are not intending on doing that, um, then th th there may need to be a change in the reality of your your married life, and and that's okay. Um, you know, again, we're not, of course, we're not advocating. You know, everyone just go and get divorced, but there are times where it is definitely warranted because there was some defect in the bond, and that's language you, we use with annulments and stuff like that. But I think that I, I found a lot of of the light bulb was click on um, for especially women who were told. Um, you know, oh, I just, th this is my suffering in life. This is what I'm supposed yeah. to do as a, as a Catholic wife. No. And yeah. I said, no, you know, you're not, you're not called to suicide. You're called to sacrifice. And there is a difference between the two. I could not agree with you more on this point. And I'm actually glad we're sort of ending with this. I once knew, well, I still know her, but I knew a woman back in the day 
who was not Catholic. She was part of an ultra conservative Presbyterian church whose mm -hmm. husband was physically abusive to her. Mm -hmm. And uh, she reported it to the police and her very conservative Presbyterian church that didn't believe in going to the police for such things. They wanted to deal with it internally. It came down on her like a ton of bricks, mm -hmm. blaming her heart. You, know, you get the whole picture. Mm -hmm. uh, she did eventually leave her husband and, and, and she's now an Orth Eastern Orthodox Christian and got married in the Orthodox Church. So what I would say in, in the cases of, of, like you just mentioned, a man who is a, a, a constant pornography user and, and his wife knows about it and he says, deal with it. I, I'm not going to change. This is a form of spousal abuse. Oh, and, yeah. it, and, and it is just as it's not a physical threat to her biological life. He's not beating her up, but it is psychologically damaging in the extreme. And it creates in the woman a sense of profound betrayal. Yes, but inferiority. And, and horrible feelings about herself. I'm a bad Catholic because I, I'm, not, I'm not loving this man enough to bring him. Or, no, in situations like that, you must leave. You must get out in some of those circumstances. Uh, not always, but often. Because like you said, it, you're not called to become a, you know, an emotional, psychological punching bag for the sake of Jesus or something. Yes. That's, th that, that's just wrong. Yes. Um, and I would also say, I, Sometimes, perhaps, and you would know better than I, if you actually do then leave your husband in a situation, it might actually be a form of shock therapy where the dude comes around and says, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I, I, I love you. I, one of those I, things before the divorce word is talked about of doing, you know, a, a, a separation, um, yeah. you know, trial separation or something like that just to see. And then, you know, sometimes it does click. But Again, you know, I only go down that road of, you know, when, you know, divorce and sort of, you know, saying that that might be a reality. This is after there's been an absolute 100 percent obstinate reaction um, to any right, type of right. help admitting that there's any type of a problem. But you're right. You know, it, it get you know, if, if that is the case, you are not meant to live this way. And this is not of, of God. This is not godly no. in any way, shape or form. No, it's not. And uh, I, I agree with you completely. But anyway, we do need to, uh, to wrap this up. We've been talking now for about an hour and 15 minutes, which is fantastic. I could talk to you for probably another three hours. On, so maybe we'll have you on again, Father Hoffa. To, uh, well, here's one of the things, and and Larry, you know, uh, I believe in this very much and in this ministry that God has blessed me to to, to participate in. And everybody, every priest feels differently about his, you know, uh, you know his cell phone. <laughs> Um, but I always say that when I was in high school work, especially probably three quarters of those kids had uh, my cell phone number um, and never once did they use it for anything um, that was, uh, you know, wrong or pranks or anything like that. But they did have it. And I did get the calls when they were in trouble. And so, uh, you know, again, uh, I'm a priest of the Diocese of Allentown in Pennsylvania and the pastor of Holy Guardian Angels Parish. And I'm also proud to be a member of the team at Integrity Restored and also the chair of our Lumen Christi Commission at the Diocese of Allentown. And for those who are struggling out there, whether it be a brother priest, uh, whether it be a religious uh, layman or woman, um, you know, whoever, because who, again, like I said, this does not discriminate. Uh, my cell phone number is 610-207-3441. If you need help, it repeat is, that. Uh, repeat that. 610-207-3441. If you need help or you need the advice of how to help someone else, give me a call. Um, I will I will do everything within my power to be able to use the resources available to me. I believe very much in this um, because it, it's so important that we start to uh, address this issue. And if I can be of assistance to that, I feel that it is the greatest use of the the incredible grace of ordination that has been shared with me by Jesus Christ. So I that that is my commitment as a priest of Jesus. Wow. Christ. Wow, that kind of chokes me up. That's that's absolutely beautiful, Father. God bless you. Uh that is very generous of you to put yourself uh, publicly your phone number out there like that. Yeah. That is that uh, that brings me back to where we started. Ladies and gentlemen, Father Alan Hoffa, one of the finest priests I know. It's my pleasure to know him, and I want to thank him from the bottom of my heart for coming on and talking today about a very serious, uh, very serious topic. So thank you, Father Hoffa, for coming on the show today. God bless you, Larry. Thanks so much.
Hang on, let me uh, turn this off.